Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Voting extended in Sudan's first multi-party elections in 24 years. Washington hosts nuclear summit and young Somalis risk their lives for a better future abroad. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. The Sudanese elections have entered their second day. Meanwhile, the National Election Commission, NEC, acknowledged that there have been technical mistakes in distributing ballot papers in some areas, in addition to changing the symbols of some candidates. The NEC confirmed that it has corrected all the mistakes reported across the Sudanese states. The commission further said it will compensate the affected candidates in the coming days. This is Sudan's first multi-party election, with Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir seeking re-election. Al-Bashir ascended to power in the aftermath of the 1989 military coup d'etat staged in the country. It seems that Bashir's road to an additional four years in the presidential office is clear. This news comes after the opposition withdrew its presidential candidates in northern Sudan. In the city of Juba, the capital of southern Sudan, Sudanese voters came out in large numbers to cast their votes in the general elections, struggling to fill nearly 12 ballots. They are voting to elect a president for Sudan, members of the National Assembly, governors of the southern states, members of the state councils, a prime minister for the government of southern Sudan, as well as its legislative council. Well, I have never voted in my life. This is my first time to vote. I have never voted in my life. This is my first time to vote. It's a good start for Sudan. It's a return to democracy. I hope this will lay the foundation for a democratic state in Sudan, where power is transferred from one president to another through peaceful means rather than through a military coup d'etat. By peaceful means, in a state of military coup. These are the first multi-party presidential, parliamentary and regional elections in 24 years. This is due in part to the peace accord which calls for holding a public referendum in 2011, in which people in the south will vote on whether to stay with the Union or secede from Sudan. Meanwhile, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, or SPLM, the ruling party in the semi-autonomous south, decided to boycott the elections in the north. The SPLM said it will only take part in the elections in the ten southern states, as well as in the Blue Nile state and southern Kurdafan, adjacent to the south. More than 800 international observers, including members of the Carter Center of former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, are monitoring the elections. We hope so. I think all of the participating parties, even those that are withdrawing... We hope so. I think that all the participating parties, even though they're withdrawing, want to see a peaceful transfer of power in Sudan. Therefore, I don't see any threats from any party trying to use violence or terrorize the voters. We hope that the elections will be free and peaceful. The elections will be held over a three-day period where citizens elect a president for their country, members of the National Assembly, and a prime minister for the government of southern Sudan. The Sudanese president is betting that these elections will restore his legitimacy in the international community. Nearly a year ago, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity in Darfur. U.S. President Barack Obama warned that organizations that seek to own a weapon of mass destruction or a nuclear weapon, such as al-Qaeda, will not hesitate to use it against the United States once they obtain it. The warning preceded the opening of the International Nuclear Summit hosted by Obama in Washington. The summit will focus on nuclear security and on finding ways to prevent such a scenario from taking place. The summit that started today also supports the U.S. administration's effort to prevent un safe nuclear equipment from spreading around the world. Emil Baruti reports from Washington. 
تستقبل العاصمة الأمريكية على مدى يومين نحو خمسة Over two days, the American capital is receiving about 50 presidents of countries, governments and international organizations and is holding a nuclear security conference. The topic had not been discussed before the September 11th incident or even before the Cold War ended when superpowers monopolized nuclear technology and material. Today, the problem is that organizations, even criminal groups, are capable of obtaining these deadly materials and of selling them on the market, using them, or giving them to terrorist groups. While security measures have been heightened for a meeting of this scale, the summit's participants will seek ways to prevent nuclear materials and technology from being transferred from those who rightfully own them to those who do not have such a right, especially terrorist groups who might use them in terrorist attacks. In that case, the September the September 11th incident would appear to be a simple event next to the specter of a nuclear attack. The attendants of the conference are not the only stars here. Some countries that were not invited to the summit were also in the spotlight despite their absence. These countries, especially Iran and maybe North Korea, are facing international law and the UN Security Council. This meeting will form a weight-bearing column for international consensus that will include Arab countries, Islamic countries and European countries such as Russia and the United States to put heavier pressure on Iran in particular and on North Korea as well. The changing pattern of nuclear threats will necessitate a complete coordination between the nuclear countries and countries that wish to gain nuclear technology in order to avoid nuclear materials from falling into unsafe hands. Emil Baroudi, Dubai TV, Washington. والملف النووي الإيراني سيكون حاضرا في قمة واشنطن لا سيما وسط تصريحات المسؤولين الأمريكيين. The Iranian nuclear issue will be presented at the Washington summit by U.S. officials who are pressuring the Iranian authority. The supreme leader of the Iranian Republic, Ali Khamenei, described the exclusion of Iran from non-nuclear states that the U.S. promised not to use nuclear weapons against as very strange, shameful, and a manic threat from the U.S. He said that it appears that the U.S. government is slanted and untrustworthy. Following Hamenei's words, the Iranian foreign ministry said that Tehran is determined to submit an official complaint to the United Nations regarding Obama's threats, as requested by the 255 representatives of the Iranian parliament. وإيران لا تمتلك قدرات نووية حتى الآن حيث أن الحكومة الأمريكية لم تتوصل إلى نتيجة. U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates said that Iran has not obtained nuclear capabilities yet, as the U.S. government has not reached the conclusion that Tehran will gain a nuclear bomb. He made this statement during a conversation with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on the NBC network. He added that Washington will continue to try persuading the Iranians that they are on the wrong path by pressuring Tehran with more sanctions. We have not. Um they are not nuclear capable, not yet. We are doing everything we can to try and keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons. They are continuing to make progress on these programs. It's going slow, slower than they anticipated, but they are moving in that direction. Well, this story, Iran's ambassador to the International Atomic Energy Agency says the U.S. nuclear threat against the Islamic Republic is a clear violation of the U.N. Charter. Dr. Ali Asghar Sultaniyeh said Washington's newly unveiled nuclear posture review proves how unreliable U.S. is on the issue of nukes. He says the new U.S. policy shows the nuclear armed power pretends it is seeking a world free of WMDs, but it is in fact a big threat to international peace itself. The posture review restricts the use of atomic bombs against non-nuclear states except Iran and North Korea. The White House and its allies accused Tehran and Pyongyang of refusing to abide by the NPT regulations. However, unlike North Korea, Iran is an NPT signatory. Iran's nuclear activities are also under the International Atomic Energy Agency's supervision. Russian President Dmitry Medvedev has warned that energy sanctions on Iran could lead to humanitarian catastrophe. Medvedev says any possible sanctions against Iran should not paralyze the country. He says previous sanctions have hardly ever worked. Medvedev is expected to arrive in Washington later Monday.
for a two-day nuclear summit hosted by U.S. President Barack Obama. The U.S. and its allies want Iran to halt its uranium enrichment activities, but Tehran insists the activities are necessary to produce fuel for its civilian nuclear plants. Hundreds of Afghans have taken to the streets to denounce the U.S. killing of civilians. Furious protesters in the southern city of Kandahar shouted anti-U.S. and anti-NATO slogans. The rally came after U.S. troops killed at least four civilians, including a woman and a child, in Kandahar's Zari district. Afghan authorities say foreign troops sprayed a bus with bullets. Afghan President Hamid Karzai has condemned the incident. In a statement, he said opening fire on a passenger bus is, quote, by no means justifiable. At least 23 more civilians were also injured in the shooting. NATO has confirmed the incident. The Western Alliance is already probing the murder of four civilians in Helmand province. Earlier this month, NATO admitted that its troops killed several civilians in the southeast of the country in February. The Western Alliance is increasingly under fire from both the Afghan public and Kabul over its killing of civilians. A Hezbollah lawmaker has accused the U.S. Embassy of impeding national reconciliation in Lebanon. Nawaf Moussaoui has warned of U.S. interference in Lebanon's internal affairs and said Washington opposes national unity. The Hezbollah MP says U.S. meddling in his country amounts to direct Israeli interference. This, he says, is because of close ties between Washington and Tel Aviv. Earlier, Moussaoui had accused the U.S. Embassy of spying for Israel. His Majesty the King will join world leaders at a nuclear security summit which will open in Washington by President Barack Obama. King Abdullah held talks with the American President on efforts to bring about peace in the Middle East as well as Jordanian U.S. ties. His Majesty will also meet top American political and economic leaders and take part in a dialogue session to be conducted at the Chicago Council for Global Affairs on Mideast Peace. Meantime, world leaders continue to arrive in the U.S. Capitol for the unprecedented nuclear security summit. While the focus will be on how to prevent nuclear terrorism, President Barack Obama will seek to build momentum with China in his push for sanctions on Iran. Obama will hold talks with Chinese President Hu Jintao before hosting high-level delegations from nearly 50 countries for the opening of the global conference. The American president hopes to cement China's commitment to help ratchet up pressure on Iran over its nuclear program after Beijing agreed to join serious talks about possible new UN sanctions on Tehran. The Washington summit is the culmination of a hectic week of nuclear diplomacy for Obama and comes a year after he laid out a vision of a world free of atomic weapons. It follows close on the heels of Obama's unveiling of a revamped U.S. nuclear doctrine limiting the use of atomic arms and the signing of a landmark post-Cold War treaty with Russia pledging to cut their nuclear arsenals by a third. Obama said he is pleased about the sense of urgency among the countries taking part over efforts to lock down loose nuclear material. In Stura Square, the military leadership found a grenade set to explode, a bomb and five glass bottles filled with gasoline. Military experts detonated them on site to avoid transporting them. Security situation on the ground changes once again, and this time in the town of Shatura. At 8 o'clock, a cafe employee found an explosive device in the middle of a square, close to the transfer terminals from which buses depart to all areas of Lebanon and to Syria. Immediately, she informed the security agency. Military detectives arrived at the scene, and after examining the device, they verified that it was made from a Chinese bombshell called Hammer. The device was tied to juice bottles placed horizontally near an electricity pole, filled with explosive materials with fuses protruding from the bottlenecks. The army cordoned off the area immediately, and the army's inspectors examined the explosive devices and concluded that they could not be dismantled. 
Specialists from the engineering department took strong measures and brought a large quantity of sand and completely covered the package. The Army later coordinated with administrators of the major domestic and international roads to detonate the package. The Army leaders from the command centre released a document saying that they found a grenade set to explode, a bomb and five glass bottles filled with gasoline in Shatura Square in front of Sukhupi Centre. The document stated that military experts arrived on site and detonated them in order to avoid transporting them, indicating that the matter is being investigated. Top official from the Popular Front in Lebanon, Abu Imad Ramis, held a press conference denying any disaccord within the front. He accused the security institutions of targeting the front's headquarters in Lebanon while Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri is about to visit Syria. After clashes broke out in the central areas of the headquarters of the Popular Front, the political representative of the Front, Abu Ahmad Ramiz, denied that the confrontations were caused by internal discord. In a press conference held in the headquarters of the Front in the Burj al barajna refugee camp, he said that some members of the other group were arrested and will be handed over to the Army Intelligence Unit. The aggressive elements do not belong to the front, even though the head schemer named Durid Shaban claimed to be a member. He organized this group in order to seize the center and its possessions, and he started by murdering one of the center's security guards. The group believed that by taking this action it may be able to take over the center. In the front's opinion, the attack aimed at pressuring Syria domestically and internationally into executing what was agreed upon in the negotiations pertaining to the Palestinian weapons outside the refugee camps. Abu Imad Ramiz expressed his hope that the Lebanese judiciary will enforce serious penalties on the perpetrators. The front showed photos of four perpetrators who are still in its custody and are under investigation. For thousands of distressed families in Somalia, the hemorrhage of young people has become a concerning phenomenon, for their children often die at sea or in the desert while in search of a better life. Civilian and social organizations, along with Somali intellectuals, are trying to raise awareness among Somali youth of the risks associated with these adventures. Our correspondent in Somalia, Mohamed Jamia, observes this phenomenon. This is not an advertisement for a product or a commodity that is gaining more popularity, but a signpost for a disease that has taken the lives of hundreds, caused thousands to go missing, and is still spreading. Illegal immigration to the West, the land of dreams. For thousands of families, these dreams often end with heart-wrenching tragedies. The goal of many young people from Somalia and Africa in general is to seek a better life in countries that are said to be good places. They usually go on that journey. Faisal Ahmed is one of those who chased a dream and risked his life. But his guardian angel saved him from a certain death, or so he says. From memory, he told his colleagues dozens of tragic stories. They listened to him in amazement, as if they were watching a Hollywood horror movie. I graduated from the Institute of Education and my hope to find work quickly vanished. The economic situation further deteriorated. Then I decided to go abroad and find the life that I want. According to social observers, research on illegal immigration conducted by the University of Harkeza in Somalia shows that 53 percent of the youth leave the country because of unemployment and 23 percent leave for their love of life in the West and other reasons. People who have been to these Western countries describe to others that the West has everything, a better life, more ways to earn a living, and a lot of money. So they contact the youth in the country and tell them these things. When they hear these stories, most young people begin to think about immigration.
While there are various reasons for illegal immigration, the outcome is the same, death in the depths of the ocean or in the desert. For these families, the suffering doesn't stop, adding insult to injury to the Somali people who have already been going through a crisis for decades. Many local organizations and prominent figures in Somalia are seeking to raise awareness among the youth of the risks of illegal immigration and are trying to increase their confidence in their country to prevent them from risking their lives to chase a deluded dream that often ends in death. Mr. Mohammed Sawalha, my first question is, do you think that the latest British position on Israel reflects an international change towards Israel in the past few months? I think that there are several reasons. One of the major reasons is the fact that the judicial body that was in charge of this matter was neutral and was not politically motivated. It is independent from the British government, and it was the one that gave the recommendations. I think this was the main reason. However, the government did not have to implement these recommendations. Yes, that is possible, but the Britons in general have strong feelings about this subject. I listened to a large number of parliament members in Britain. They feel that Israel does not respect Britain and that Israel acts like it has immunity and can do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. If the Zionist government did not feel that way, it wouldn't have dared to violate the laws of a large number of countries by forging their passports. This approach has been continually used by the Zionist government. It does not care about other countries. It expects others to treat it like it is above the law, as if it was a spoiled child. Israel expects the world to accept its actions. After the British foreign ministry decided to expel the Israeli diplomat, the response of Israeli officials was reckless and reflected a lack of respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An Israeli parliament member said that the Britons are dogs. He did not say that about the British government, but he said that the Britons are dogs. He even said that dogs are more loyal than the Britons. This shows that Israelis feel superior to everyone else. I think that this is bad for Israel, which is losing Western support. Any reasonable person in Britain and the West would not accept this kind of behavior. I also have a comment to make about what happened in the investigation and what was said a while ago, that the British government is not interested in investigating the actual crime, the assassination of the Hamas leader. Theater. I think that this is not the right approach. When a crime related to terrorism takes place anywhere in the world with ties to Britain, the British government plays a major role in the investigation. For example, not too long ago, a Nigerian national who was studying at the UCL in London was recruited in Yemen. Britain was linked to this incident because the man was studying in London. He was not recruited in Britain, and he is not a British national, he is Nigerian. But because he was studying in Britain, the government and the security agencies here got tense. They started contacting people, and they investigated a large number of students and student organizations. The British media made a big story out of the incident. Why? Because this is how Britain has been acting recently. Whenever terrorism-related crimes take place, Britain interferes. The question is, why doesn't Britain do the same when Israel is involved? For example, why were all the men mentioned in the investigation of the Hamas leader assassination just presumed to be innocent? Why weren't they investigated? Some of them disappeared. Israeli and Western media tried to contact them, but they disappeared. Also, the German national whose name came up during the investigation, he also disappeared. He completely believes that he has a duty to serve Israel. Why do we presume that all the people whose names came up in the investigation are innocent? One example is the attempted assassination of Hamas political bureau chief Khaled Mishal in Jordan. It turned out that some of the people whose passports were used willingly gave the Israeli intelligence their own passports. 
This could only mean that they did this in collaboration with Israel in order to show their loyalty. This also means that some of the people whose names came up during the investigation could have acted the same way. We demand the British government conduct a serious investigation. The most revolutionary cosmetic surgery techniques were introduced today at the second International Plastic Surgery Conference underway in the Saudi city of Jeddah. Participants at the conference presented working papers about their latest medical achievements in the field. At the second International Plastic Surgery Conference, the participating panels discussed more than 80 working papers. The panels included a number of renowned surgeons and female professors from nearly 11 countries. The conference included nine plastic surgery workshops. We use lasers to treat some skin disorders and burns. This is one of the procedures that we're using now. Before, we used to perform surgery for a facelift. However, we now use lasers or fat injection procedures. This gave us an alternative to major medical surgery. One of the Russian doctors presented a revolutionary technique that could be used in facelift procedures. It is by and large the most advanced procedure in the world. These threads, which were custom made, are used in contour threading facelift procedures. This is usually done by threading and tightening the connective tissue layer beneath the skin, giving it long-lasting effect. Women are the overwhelming focus of this conference, as silicon breast implants could be replaced by tissue grown from a person's own stem cells. This procedure can help the body reconstruct lost tissue or construct tissue in a less invasive manner. Before, stem cells used to be harvested from embryonic cells. However, we can now harvest stem cells from the fat of the person's own body. This is done by extracting nearly 300 milligrams of fat, and by using special equipment or technology, we can harvest the stem cells. There are many people... Um there are many people who believe that the injection of body fat is an easy process. The process requires accuracy and concentration. Also, the proportion has to be balanced in order to avoid any complications. It has become easy to shed extra pounds without undergoing a surgical procedure. This news comes after a number of revolutionary techniques were introduced by special cosmetic associations that participated at the Jeddah conference. The conference wants to convey a message to society that plastic surgery is no longer a frightening procedure and that the distance between beauty and those searching for it is a mere visit to the operation room. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters. Not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org/mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.